Remember Herod's uh, party that we talked about, the one I um, compared to the lair of Jabba the Hutt, right? Party with dancing. And instead of a birthday, ca- birthday cake, the head of a prophet, John the Baptist, uh, on a platter. Remember that for a second. Herod is a certain kind of leader. Most of his subjects are at best just able to feed themselves and their families, and nearly all are desperate and vulnerable in absolutely every way. Yet Herod is throwing a lavish party for his court, his friends, and while he's at it, he assassinates holy prophets because they challenge that kind of authority. Holy prophets challenge that kind of authority. Jeremiah in the Old Testament reading pronouncing that God's goodness and justice will prevail over the destructive shepherds like Herod who, quote, scatter and destroy the sheep of my pasture. It's like Herod. It's like Herod and so many other leaders throughout the time, throughout the course of history, the way power, the pyramid of power, favors very few, while many, many suffer. And it's real in our contemporary moment, this moment that we live in right now. Jeremiah the prophet's condemning that crushing pattern of leaders. They have the power and the resources to care for the holistic health of their people, but choose to preserve that power and that privilege, and that wealth at all costs. And what that means for these kinds of leaders is that they keep people weak and vulnerable and powerless. And one way people have and still do this work as leaders is that they silence those prophetic voices who dare to say to the faithful, to believe that God, the source of all that is good, the ground of our very being, will not let this stand. This will not be the way it is forever. Jeremiah and the prophets are condemning the kinds of leaders that would scatter and destroy God's people. Like here. And they point us toward the one that is coming from the line of David that will reign in love. And that's the one we encounter in Mark's gospel, the one whom the the prophets foretold, Jesus. It's a very different kind of power, is it not? It's different from the rulers of the ancient Near East that Jesus is entangling with. Whether he knows it yet or not, I'm sure he does. He's gathered quite a following. He is being seen for the work that he's doing among the people that these leaders have neglected. Jesus, and this set that scene up for a second from the gospel. Jesus and his disciples have been very busy. They have been very busy and they need some rest. And so they go to a place, a deserted place, they say, where they think they can get that sort of respite. But the people see them from on high. If you've ever been to that part of the world, you can see a lot from on high. And people see this Jesus and his following, and they, they, by foot, make their way around and meet the boat when it moors. And Jesus is at a point, a point that we all come to in our walk with God when we're tired, in need of rest, but there's a need right in front, in front of us. And it says in here that Jesus sees a great crowd gathered in that deserted place seeking him out where he is, where he's gone to rest. And it says he's had, he has compassion for them. And this word compassion in Greek does not have a good modern Uh, translation in English that is sufficient for it. Compassion is not enough. I'm talking about bone deep, whole being shaking 
with love, compassion. Teeth chattering, compassion. Spirit filled, compassion. Gut wrenching, body, spirit, and mind, compassion in that moment. When I hold shepherds like Herod and Jesus in tension with one another, I see a paradox that I recognize in myself and in society, all of us. I see Herod in me as I reflect on what I will call my Calvary Episcopal Church rectory rejections. If you've ever been to Calvary Church in Cleveland, Mississippi, we occupy about a half block. So there's the office, there's the rectory, there's the sanctuary. The architecture, the design, all those sorts of things match. And so sometimes when I was retreating to my deserted place, that rectory, people couldn't find me in the office, so they knocked on the building that looks like the office. And that is where I met them in their need. You can call it healthy boundaries. You can call it what, it, what, it, what you will. And these were not parishioners, by the way. People in desperate need. Basic sort of things that they needed. I met them with, this is my house. That is the office. If I'm not in my office, I'm not available. There was no teeth-chattering compassion in me on those occasions. I recognize that in those moments, I failed to do what Jesus does on the banks of this great lake. But there are also those sparse moments peppered in my journey with God where God's love, despite all of my selfishness, wins. It wins. And I've walked alongside people through really holy times where they have been broken up. Broken in every way imaginable. And steadily walked alongside them in love until God put them back together again. And these times that I've walked alongside people, by the grace of God, I had the grace to do that in my, even though it was inconvenient, even though I needed to be doing perhaps some resting or some other things that would take care of me. And I was filled in those times with amazing grace, good goodness. Holiness. I see the powers at tension in our society as I look at the lack of basic things in our state health care, affordable health care, quality schools for all children, no matter where they live. And the way that our leaders, time and time again, walk up to those crowds in desperate need. And instead of having compassion, they ignore or even lay blame on those very people in need, the less fortunate. But there are also those in our world who do that work of awakening to the kind of compassion that we meet in the gospel today. And these are leaders and organizations that stand, to, they, they dare to stare directly, directly into that brokenness the lack of justice, the way we are divided, and they dare to do God's love in that moment. And these are leaders who see the scattered and the, those being destroyed, and they offer mercy that is within their power to grant. These are the reconcilers. These are the healers. They are from every country. They're from every faith. And they are from both sides of the aisles. And what unites them all is that power of compassion. Compassion is not enough, but that soul-shaking kind of love. 
that sometimes God uses in us, that holy potential that we all carry. Compassion over indifference. And what unites them is simple, and that is that we are connected. We are one. We are common. We are one. What is broken in one of us is broken in all of us. This mercy, this justice, and this love, it is the work of the church that we are parts of. It's the work of Jesus that we are left to do. Follow Jesus into that bone-deep compassion for all that we encounter. The compassion for all who are broken because, again, when one of us is broken, we are all broken, and the only power in this world that can make us whole is God's love. Amen.